So, uh, today I want to pick up from the class that I did on Philo of Alexandria, which I think probably maybe half the people here were there. The, uh, the idea then was very much this question of who, what is the enemy? Who is the enemy? What is the enemy? What are we fighting? You know, why, why, are, we, uh, why are we a political movement that's, that, that's talking about Plato? Why are we a political movement that's talking about Philo of Alexandria? You know, what, why is this so important? And the polemic that we began to develop there that is certainly something, you know, this is what Lynn is pressing on us, LaRouche is pressing on us to continue to develop in this time of incredible danger, is against the belief in sense perception as such, sense certainty otherwise known as, right? The idea which I'll develop across the course of this, that um, the idea that reality is perception. It's what you can see before you. Right? This is what we are opposed to. This is the empire as it exists in the mind, because the battlefield is in the mind. Right? And that's the, uh, what I intend to demonstrate over the course of the class, is that you have, um, we're going to go through the case of Plato, in particular the, uh, the, the Theotetus uh, dialogue. Uh, which I've been studying over the past about month and a half or two months. We've been doing weekly readings um, with some of the people out in Detroit. And it's been just tremendous to begin to get a fuller sense of 3,000 years of history and to, give your, uh, to get into your own mind and, th and sort of c place yourself within those 3,000 years and then on into infinity, uh, which of course you know, this is, this, is the, um, this is the way that LaRouche thinks. This is the way that Martin Luther King thought. This is the way that Joan of Arc was thinking in terms of a, a true uh, sense of, of what is the battle? What, why are we fighting? And why is it that we continue to fight? So um, the question is, what is the, uh, what's the weapon? How do we bring down the, the empire of empiricism, reductionism, whatever you want to call it, These, this, this belief in sense, sense certainty? And the answer has been emphatically metaphor. Through an investigation and the use and the demonstration of the principle of metaphor, we will be victorious. And there's no other way to do it. It's not, there's not some sort of like cheat, corn, you know, cut the corner and get there some other way. The only way that we're going to accomplish this transformation is through the use of metaphor. So the question is, what does that mean? What is metaphor? What, what is Lynn talking about when every paper he writes, he seems to be talking about metaphor over the past six months, over the past year? And that's, so that's the idea today, is to get into that through a lens of Plato in particular and the Theotetus dialogue. Uh, so I want to just, before we get really started, w the way that I think about this practically is I can remember sitting back where Eli's sitting uh, on, a, on a day about a week and a half, two weeks before I, uh, I joined full time. And that was back in February. So the meeting must have been mid-January. And Jason Ross of the basement, Leona of the basement, they were um, giving a class, and the class was on, uh, it was on the galactic cycles and various other things. It was quite remarkable to me. But at the end of the class, I stood up, and I was trying to figure out, maybe Diane remembers, I was trying to figure out how do you organize someone about the impending threat of thermonuclear annihilation? How on earth am I supposed to talk to anyone about this? You know, because I was trying to, trying to figure it out. Sure, okay, so I'll, there's some kind of pathway. There's some way, I, if I just get a couple of stepping stones, then I'll be able to leap to the, to the threat of war, of, of the annihilation of the human race, right? 
So I stood up and I asked this rambling question where I didn't really know where I was going, I didn't know really, really know what I was saying, but I, I put forth all these predicates. I said, well, considering X and considering Y and considering Z, and then finally I just said, how do you tell people that we're facing thermonuclear war? And Jason Ross was very direct about it. He said, well, you should just tell them. <laughs> you know, you should, just, you should just assert it, but you have to use metaphor. You cannot, uh, you have to demonstrate to someone that there is a reality that is located in the future, that is outside of time as we know it, that is to say clock time, that is outside of the sort of normal understanding that this dark age society operates under. So you have to, you have to puncture some, someone's axioms and lift them up. But he was clear on this that the only way, you, the first thing you got to do is you got to just tell it to them straight. You got to assert it, and you have to do that with leadership. Um, so that's what it means practically to me about the question of metaphor and what is and how can this develop our minds is getting ourselves, everyone in this room and everyone that we talk to, to be capable of addressing the fact that the enemy is reductionism, the enemy are these fallacies, we, we are going to attack those with metaphor, that's how we're going to achieve the mission of the, of the continual development and progress of mankind. Excuse me. So I wanted to begin with just a, um, with a classic and very pure example of metaphor in Ode on a Grecian Urn. So I gave, I, everyone should have a copy, but if you don't, then Denise has some in the back. And please just say so. Okay. So Eli needs a set. Does anyone else need a set? Diane? Because this poem is very frequently referenced by Lynn, and uh, it's, of course, extremely famous. So we're just going to go through it, and I'm going to try to point out a couple of the ironies that are set before us and give us a framework for thinking about what is metaphor. And then we're going to actually refer to something that, that Lynn has written on this, and then we are going to go into Plato. So I'll wait until everyone's sitting down and then I'll, and I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a go. Of course, this is a poem that he is writing to a Grecian urn, to an ancient urn that has embossed on it a, a, a pastoral scene. Um, Ode on a Grecian urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals, or of both, in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maiden's loth? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the spirit, ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy bows, 
that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm, and still to be enjoyed, forever panting, and forever young. All breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of its folk this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. So it's such a rich poem that there's, um, there's these beautiful ironies in practically every line. Uh, but I wanted to reference a couple. I mean, uh, first of all, there's the overarching irony of the fact that he is immortalizing the urn in verse. So what we are presented with is the living ghost of the Grecian urn, which it exists now in a higher form even than its actual physical reality. And he has truly made it immortal through this poem. So that's, that's something that's, that, that encircles the whole. And then throughout you have these, uh, you have these, uh, these ironies. For example, the very, the very beginning he says, Sylvan historian, who canst thou thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? And then there's the colon. So here's, here's thus you express it. And what he goes into is a series of questions. Uh, so there is, clearly there's something behind the notes, behind the scenes, so to speak. There's something between the notes of, he's saying that this, the urn is expressing something. What it provokes is question after question after question after question. This wondering, this, this, this quality of, um, of continual uh, desire to know, to know more, to know what, what, is, what is the quality of this. Um, rather than what you might expect, which would be an ekphrasis, a, uh, a detailed explanation, right? Where he would say, oh, well, well, first there's this, there's it's this god, and it's this maiden, and it's this story, and there's four of them, and they're at this river, and so on and so forth. Instead, that's not it at all. It has nothing to do with the details. It has everything to do with this higher existence of the, uh, of the artwork, of the beauty itself. So then a couple other things I wanted to bring out in it. You have, uh, you have this... This quality that I'll reference, we'll get a reference to it later in, some, in what Lynn wrote that I gave to you, of, um, of this moment in time 
that is suspended and somehow plucked entirely from time and, and, and above time now because it's been elevated through beauty above the question of clock time into a sort of a spiritual time, when, which is eternal, which would be, that is to say, uh, a time without, uh, yeah, without before and after, whatever you want to say. Um, so that, for example, the bold lover never can, never, 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 never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. He's never, ever going to kiss her, but he's always winning towards the goal. He's always almost about to, which is, of course, uh, an anomaly. That's an irony, because how could he possibly be almost about to kiss her if he's never, ever, ever going to kiss her? And yet, it exists in this form. Um, and there's, of course, there's much more that we could go into, but I, I went down to the, to the second to last stanza. Um, and this, this, this once more, this type of irony where he's appealing to, he's wondering about this, not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. No one can ever come out of the village and walk up and say, hey, well, this is, you know, the, the village is empty because, uh, because uh, th this will never take place. Um, and yet he mourns for it, in a sense. He grieves for this fact, despite the fact that it, it's entirely in the mind, that this, is a, this has nothing, it, it is not sensual, in a sense. So the last Stanza is, of course, the richest, or at least the most famous, and it has this. What, what I want to select in particular from it, and we will return to beauty is truth, truth beauty, but is this line, this, uh, in the middle. Thou silent form dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity, cold pastoral. And in terms of the uh, structure of the uh, of the of this stanza, it's quite this enjambment where you have the, the line is broken up into two parts, right there. Because no, normally, if you look into the the uh, the structure of the poem, he has uh, basically more or less uh, like four lines that are a single idea, and then four lines, and then two lines, and those comprise a a, a, a stanza. That's generally how it connects, right? Like, like, for example, the second stanza, the first four lines are about the melodies, the next four lines are about the youth, and then the last two lines are about the, um, are about the, 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 the beauty that cannot fade of the lover, right? But then in this final stanza, you have this broken line in the sense that thou silent form dost tease us out of thought is at the end of that four line part, chunk. And yet, as you're being teased out of thought, you are brought in the next moment, as normally you would be stopping there. And in other words, the phrase would be sort of closing. But instead, you're continued through, as doth eternity. And it's this that this, this sort of irony within the structure of the poem that demonstrates exactly what he's trying to get at in the sense that the, uh, he, you are, you're plucked out of time by this, by the ode, by, just as he was plucked out of time by the urn, by his, by his uh, gazing upon the urn. And so in that moment, all of a sudden the, uh, the sort of tick-tock of the, of the poem kind of stops. And you, because you have the enjam, you have the broken up line, as doth eternity, uh, then rises you up to this understanding that we are, what, when, what, what we're faced with is man making contact with the divine, right? Or how, how is it that we reach up to an idea, as Diane was expressing, of this this real new understanding of mankind, of this, what is this beautiful truth about the eternal soul, 
in a sense. And I don't, you know, uh, this is, um, well, you'll see. When I, the, the words that we use don't have all that much to do. The names don't have that much to do with, with, what, with the discussion, because the discussion is about the infinite. And so don't be uh, put, up, put off if I'm, if I'm using religious uh, phraseology. Anyway, so, so I wanted to put those forward as a few different ways of thinking about metaphor. That what you have are these gaps in sense perception. You have this way where things are juxtaposed and they don't seem to make sense in a sensual way, in a way that you could perceive of in a sort of a, a, an idea that was based on everything that had come before. You have to overleap that and go to a higher understanding of, of existence. So that's my hypothesis on this, is that the higher understanding comes out in particular in these two lines, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity. I mean, think about that. You're teased out of thought. You're no, you're, <laughs> your imagination, in other words, is not sufficient. It's, it's something that is even beyond that. Um, and that's a way to get into metaphor. That, that's, my, that's why I'm presenting this here. Um, so, having put that forward, let's see, I think I'm going to go, we'll come back to the other sheet later. Um, so, I want to counterpose this right away to, um, to what you get from people who are thinking in a deductive way, in a pragmatic, pragmatic way, who do not accept the reality of metaphor. Okay, this is, this, you know, so someone says to you, now get practical. Or someone says to you, you know, come down to earth, all right, come down to earth. Let's, uh, let's, let's be serious about this. Now get realistic, okay. Now, let, you know, I don't see that happening. That, 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 right? This isn't, that, that's impossible. This isn't, and when they're saying that's impossible, they're saying, from the standpoint of the past, that could not happen. And Leona had a beautiful, uh, clever way of referring to this in the weekly report of this past week, where she said, well, think about it this way. When we're talking about statistics, something that, an idea of, of thinking about the future that is based entirely on the past, then, well, it has everything to do with everything that has happened before. So your computer system sort of, your, your, your data points are all things that have already happened before. So if you're thinking about the economy that way, then of course there's never going to be a general breakdown of the global economy because that's never happened before. So there's a st statistical probability of zero of the, uh, of the global economy disintegrating. And so you would say, no, no, <laughs> before I even investigate, I'm going to decide it could not happen, right? And that's the, that's the backwardness of this sense perceptual obsession. Right, sense, the obsession with sense certainty. Similarly, well, global thermonuclear war has never happened before, so it's not in my card catalog of things that could happen, you know. It's not, it's not in my system. I go searching for what could possibly happen in 2012, and it doesn't come up, right? Because it's never happened before. But that does not mean that it won't happen. <laughs> that actually has nothing to do with the way that the universe works. It's in completely opposite and it is the oligarchical moat. That is the empire. And that's what we have to defeat. And so now I can move forward into, into back to, into Plato, okay? Because, oops, that's Aristotle. Okay. Um, here is Plato's Academy. What I wanted to start with is an idea of, of what was Plato doing? Because when I started to study the Theotetus, I didn't really know. I knew that he had written a bunch of dialogues. I thought, okay, I know he's smart. I know he's a philosopher. 
and, uh, and I know that he's essential to the foundation of Western civilization. But as far as I know, he's just the guy who, you know, according, as far as I can tell from the painting, he walks around in a nice big, <laughs> in a nice big room, and, uh, and he thinks and he talks to people. Okay, so the reality is that he was a tremendous fighter in the political sphere. And what Plato was engaged in, uh, in uh, now around 400 BC, and later, I have a good little, let's see if I can pull up my other thing. What Plato was engaged in was a political battle against the oligarchy. Now, at the time, the oligarchy was the Persian Empire. You had this beautiful city of Athens that was doing these tremendous things that had never been done before. Uh, and was, and you know, it's developing to the point where their military science, science was such that even their small forces could fend off the, uh, the Persian Empire. At the same time, you had a, uh, you had a, um, a fight to corrupt Athens from the inside. And the people who were doing this were known as the Sophists, among others. And these were, it was essentially, now, I, I haven't done that much study on the history. I still have a lot of work to do on that. So I'm kind of sketchy with my details. But basically, you had um, first, you know, in fact, I'm just going to read straight from Bruce Director's article because it's really quite good. And pardon me for sitting down here. Um, OK. Here we go. In 399 BC, as Athens reeled from the economic and political turmoil associated with the Peloponnesian Wars, an aged Socrates had a remarkable conversation about the cause of that crisis with an extraordinary young man. And Bruce right here is talking about the Theotetus dialogue. More than 30 years later, facing the continuation of that same crisis, Plato immortalized that discussion in an historical drama that has since become known by the name of Socrates' interlocutor, Theotetus. So the, uh, and I'll go into it. Yeah, this, is, this is worth working through. By that time, Socrates had long since been tried and executed. Okay, so, so the discussion happens, and then 30 years later, Plato records it as the dialogue, which, which, um, which we're going to take a look at some of. By the time Plato has recorded it, Socrates has been executed. And Theotetus has died from mortal wounds sustained in a military battle near Corinth. Plato, as a protagonist in that history, insisted that the central question of that colloquy, what is knowledge, was of momentous importance for the immediate survival of Greek culture. Thus, he set his drama in the historical context in which it occurred, intending to provoke his contemporaries and all subsequent generations, such as ours, to face this question as it should be faced, as the defining issue of life and death for civilization. As in all classical dramas, the opening scene of the Theotetus sets the stage for what follows by providing the audience with the historical context from which, uh, from which to see the unfolding events. In this case, those events are heard through the ears of Eucleides of Megara and Terpsion, who recreate the celebrated conversation some 30 years after it occurred. This retrospective is prompted when Eucleides reports to Terpsian that he has just been to the harbor and has seen Theotetus being carried to Athens, having been badly wounded in a battle near Corinth and suffering from the dysentery that has infected the army. Upon hearing the news, Terpsian exclaims, oh, what a loss he will be, which prompts Eucleides to recall. And, uh, and he goes into, so, so at this point in the dialogue, we're still in the introduction. We're getting to know who was Theotetus. He's this young person who just died, who was you know, on the verge of death here. In introducing Theotetus at the moment of his death, Plato sought to provoke his contemporaries to reflect on such questions as has been referenced earlier. Why did he die? What was this battle? Why did it come about? What hope had Socrates found in him? 
why, what had the Sac well, excuse me, what had the Greeks now lost? So, Socrates is, or Plato is hoping that his contemporaries will understand that what Socrates had recognized in the youthful Theotetus was the key to reversing their continuing misfortune. Plato's contemporaries were not so roused, and Greek civilization continued its decline, ultimately yielding to the power of imperial Rome. Today, our contemporaries should likewise be stirred by Plato's account, but they are, for the most part, blind to this history. Such dullness indicates not a mere lack of refinement. It certifies that our mo modern culture suffers from the same affliction as Plato's. Although we cannot change the response of Plato's contemporaries to his drama, we can determine ours. Their history is written, ours is yet to be. So I'll make this big and I'm just going to read a little bit more. The Life and Times of Theotetus. The battle in which Theotetus was mortally wounded occurred near Corinth in 369 BC and was part of a continuing series of internecine wars that had ravaged Greece for much of the previous century. In the early part of the 5th century BC, the Greeks had united in a defense against a series of military assaults from the Persian Empire. That defense succeeded because of the relatively higher moral and intellectual development of Greek society over imperial Persia. This higher quality of development was a reflection of the concept of the nature of man that had been developing in the Greek-speaking war world, as typified by the reforms of Solon and the scientific discoveries of Thales and the Pythagoreans. In reaction to their defeat, the imperialists realized recognized that to subdue the relatively higher culture of Greece, they had to undermine the commitment of Greek culture to the development of the creative powers of the mind. By 450 BC, the Greeks began to succumb to this more subtle and ultimately more successful attack from the imperial quarters. Working through their confederates in the cult of Apollo at Delphi, the imperial powers cultivated a coalition of the willing from among the most backward and corrupt elements of Greek society, typified by the alliance centered around the city-state of, and I don't know how to pronounce this, but Boeotia. Anyway. So, uh, and then just this little section here. The sophists, accepting the denial of the existence of human creativity as an, as an axiom, accepting the denial of the existence of human creativity as an axiom, insisted, therefore, that nothing could be known except that which is perceived through the senses. Everything else is simply a matter of opinion, whose truth is determined solely by its popularity of the moment. For the sophists and those who believed in them, truth did not exist, because it would interfere with the illusory power that sophistry had apparently produced. So that is easily relatable to today, I'm sure to most people, right? This is, uh, this is what we're presented with. This is what we're seeing in the financial sphere. This is what we're seeing in the cultural sphere. I mean, all of these are interlocked. The idea that, well, as long as it seems like it's solvent to the outward glance, then it's solvent. We're not going to worry about it. As long as uh, it's just your opinion. <laughs> and of course, that's what you hear in the field a lot, too. This is another one of those deductive lines that you hear. Uh, well, that's just your opinion. You know, <laughs> Obama's a mass murderer. That's just your opinion. <laughs> and, uh, and it does imply a total lack of moral uh, rectitude and a capacity to deal with questions of morality. You know, I mean, I think, Alvin, you were referencing how we're having more people taking leaflets and so on, and there's just an uptick. We were also in the Huffington Post online from that deployment that we did on, uh, maybe Lynn sent you the email, on um, 73rd, no, 79th and 3rd. And uh, so that was good. There's an, there's an uptick in terms of recognition. There's also an uptick in terms of, uh, of harassment. <laughs> and people wanting to take our signs and people wanting to physically attack us and so forth. And 
now, every time I go out into Manhattan, when I say that Obama is a killer, people say, you're a killer. Because <laughs> apparently, because I, I I'm stating this fact about the president, I'm a killer. And uh, I get that like four or five times a day. So obviously, that's a person who's decided that they have no reason to act according to truth, that their whole question is merely about public opinion. They think that if they can smear me, then it's true. If they call me a killer, or they call me, you know, in other words, if they call me stupid or insane, then I'm stupid or insane, right? And that solves it for them. So they can just sew it right up, and they can walk off, and they can forget the whole episode. Um, yes, Eugene? Well, I think that perception by sense uh -huh. Yes. But it's not OK. Well, let's, let's take that up, all right? Because so that's, that's, that's exactly the question we're going to look at today. Because, OK, now you phrased it very particularly. It's a part of reality, but it's not all of reality. So let's keep that hypothesis in mind as we continue. Because I think, actually, we're going we're gonna to see something that's a little bit different. But Mm -hmm. This guy's philosophy, I think, was expressed in uh, the guy who communicated to the Green Party uh, in Germany a little while back, which uh, she, she had to come across and gave us a, with the, Diane mm -hmm. gave us a thing on the Green Party, and this guy who had uh, communicated to them you know, how they were to uh, affect the discussion on the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This guy was using the same philosophy mm -hmm. regarding how to use that tactic. And that's my point in bringing this up. That's part of my, my intention here is to get it across to people that what, you, what we do is what Plato did. We do the same thing. Uh, you write, you, the, the writing that, that Lynn puts out that is read by top leadership around the globe, the, the work that we do on the streets to, to organize the population, the institutional work. Uh, I mean, the, Plato's letters are all about the various times that he tried to convince certain um, city-states to, to come over to the idea of mankind as a creative uh, species. And this attempt was thwarted a number of times. They tried to convince uh, Dionysius II uh, that he should be on their team, that he should be on the side of, of, the, uh, of Plato's academy. And twice he captured um, Plato and refused to, uh, to agree to this. Um, although at another point in time, I believe he gave essentially a half a million dollars in, in you know, ancient Greek money to, uh, to the academy. So these were battles where you could see that they're, they're fighting political battles. They're looking from the standpoint of the strategic question because they know that they're being attacked. Um, and, uh, and just to continue to return, what's being attacked is the idea of metaphor. So, so when all of this is to say that Plato was engaged in a fight to make, to, to get across to people metaphor, to get the people to understand that there is a principle of the universe metaphor. So I'm going to try to develop that idea. What is metaphor? And what was he doing? Why is it that he's so important? Because his method, the scientific method of Socrates and Plato is the basis for, uh, for what we do today. So that's, so let's take a look at this. This is statements from Lynn in 2003. Uh, LaRouche was answering, was at a Q&A of a Schiller conference, Schiller Institute conference, I believe. And I like this because I'm going to read through the whole thing. It's kind of lengthy, but it, it gives you an idea. He's going to present to you all these different things. And he's going to say, well, these are all metaphor. And this is. Uh, so this is significant. It's very particular ideas throughout history. Someone asked him, I was wondering about the difference between metaphor and symbolism. 
And I was wondering if you can explain the difference. Because this is, you know, today, if you're going up, you're in, you're in your fifth grade creative writing class, and a metaphor is when you compare something to something else, and you don't use the word like. Right? That's, that's what I was taught, right? <laughs> and then, uh, uh, you know, that the, uh, the um, yeah, except, except right, that, that always, if you use the word like, then it's a simile. But if you don't use the word like, then it's a metaphor, right? So that the, uh, his, uh, her, her, her eyes were placid pools. That's a metaphor, right? Um, the man was a rhinoceros. That's, that's a metaphor, okay, apparently, right? But, okay, so now we get an idea that that's, we're going to categorize that lower understanding, really like fifth grade, fourth grade, third grade understanding, second grade, of uh, metaphor. We're going <laughs> to, first grade, <laughs> we're going to classify that under symbolism for now, as, uh, in the context of this. And now we're going to get at the scientific principle of metaphor. What is Lynn talking about? He's not talking about the man is a rhinoceros, <laughs> uh, except maybe for Christie, Governor Christie. Okay. So, Lynn responds, metaphor is actually an idea. A simile is not, first of all. Metaphor pertains to the gaps in description. All the classical dialogues of Plato involve the principle of metaphor. For example, in the case of the discovery of the principle of gravitation, that, in, a de in decadent culture, which was romantic culture up through the 16th century, or most of it, it was generally believed that we could know, or that what we could know in the physical universe was merely a description of some consistent pattern of behavior as observed with the senses. In romantic culture, that is a decadent culture, up through the 16th century, or most of it, that's when we, mostly people thought that what we could know in the physical universe was merely a description, description of a pattern observed with the senses. Now, what Kepler showed, and this was the character of the metaphor, was that the orbit of Mars in the first instance was not circular, which makes it fairly irregular motion. But worse than that, the motion within the ellipse was not uniform, even within the terms of the ellipse but the motion was based on this principle of equal areas, equal time. So, there was constant change in motion at all times. It was never uniform. It was always non-uniform. Now, of the basis of the fact that the orbit was elliptical, and then carry that further to show how the solar system essentially functions in these terms, and on the basis of non-uniform motion, defined a principle of gravitation based on an anomaly or a set of anomalies, the elliptical anomaly, the non-uniform motion anomaly, and others to show that something existed outside ordinary sense perceptual interpretation, which actually caused the universe to function the way it did. So this, Lynn is talking in a sort of uh, expansive way. So it, it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to keep up, but the, the key idea is I think we can we can get them. Um, something existed outside ordinary sense perceptual interpretation. And it was because of a set of anomalies that were discovered. So therefore, anything which shows truthfully, anything which shows truthfully that in what people ordinary believe from sense perception or mere description is not true is a metaphor. And for example, some idiot would say gravitation is defined by Galileo. It is not. So the difference between gravitation as defined by Galileo and Kepler is a metaphor. Newton, the same thing. Newton's concept is absurd. Newton actually plagiarized Galileo's interpretation of the publication of Kepler's new astronomy. So Newton discovered nothing. Newton's system was based on a plagiarism of Kepler's new astronomy an English edition, published in the latter part of the 17th century, interpreted from the standpoint of the doctrine of Galileo. So to use the term gravitation in the two cases is metaphorical, because it means two opposite things, completely different kinds of things under the circumstances. All art means that. For example, the best case, of course, is simple Bachian counterpoint. 
you find that if you change a direction, you get an opposition and an apposition, which creates an irony, which creates a metaphor. The whole basis of box composition is all metaphor. It is not simple mechanical rules. They are ironies. And the irony becomes an idea which emerges from the composition, which stands outside and above the composition. This is true in great poetry. For example, the most famous case is Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn, a short poem by him, and everything is in there. Note, uh, note the irony there. Oh, yes, note the irony there. The metaphor is very simple. Remember the classic characteristic of classical Greek sculpture is that it, instead of tombstone art, the figure is captured in mid-motion. So you are not looking at a fixed standing body. You are looking at something captured in mid-motion, like a photograph in mid-motion. Now the principle for doing that is demonstrated by the catenary principle, otherwise known as the principle of least action. That is Leibniz's principle of least action. That, or that is Leibniz's principle of least action. So therefore, what Keats is doing is in describing that truth is beauty and so forth, and all these things about these figures captured in mid-motion, even though he's looking at a fixed object, a vase, an ancient vase, is a metaphor, what he's doing in describing that. And the metaphor is that, is that if, if you know what he is talking about, about classical Greek cult sculpture, that sort of thing, you see the way he uses the idea that truth is beauty and beauty is truth. How does he make that equation? What do you mean truth is beauty and beauty is truth? How did he make that equation? He did it. He referenced a metaphor in terms of the composition of this business. So a metaphor essentially means what lies between the gaps in sense perception. The principles which are not seen through sense perception, not seen by statistical deduction, but an irony of meaning, a complication in meaning, where two words don't mean the same thing in the same sentence, but in a different context. That's metaphor, the use of any of these devices. So what I want to reference about that is that the thing that's wonderful about Lin is that if he's trying to talk to you about metaphor, he's going to do so metaphorically. Because otherwise, why, why would he be doing it? He's not going to talk about something, describe it. That's exactly what he's railing against. So when you, you have to take this type of answer and the papers that he writes and his work as a whole, going from the time when he was, you know, from the 50s to now, as a single uh, unity of work, in a sense. From that point, standpoint, you can identify the ironies. You know, for the, like the ironies that he sets forth in this are clear. The art is the same thing as science. It's something that, that we've been trained out of over the course of the past couple centuries. But then um, all art means that. Yeah, seems like they're, yeah, they don't belong with each other, right? But so there's an anomaly. So he's set forth some anomalies for us. Um, furthermore, yeah. So, and on top, uh, just sort of to develop this, we, we operate as an organization on the basis of Schiller's idea that the greatest art is political freedom. So it is actually the manifestation of our work in the world that represents the greatest metaphor, if we succeed, right? So I just want to provoke people with that sort of idea. And if anyone wants to make any comments, please jump in whenever, or questions or whatever. Okay, so, yeah.
Take it in the whole idea. Yeah, like you're still like you couldn't um, know that exists. I I think I know what you mean. Yeah, there's no right. Yeah. Well, I was gonna. What you provoked in my mind was people have been. Everyone here has been to the Met, I'm sure, the Metropolitan Art Museum, and there's the. A painting, and I'm blanking. It's very famous who who, who painted it, but of uh, of Aristotle touching the the bust of Homer, Rembrandt. Rembrandt thank you. And um, and it's the same type of thing that you're describing. I think there's this irony where the bust of Homer has this incredibly human quality, where you can see the soul behind Homer, even though Homer is a sculpture. And he's not actually a sculpture because he's actually a painting. <laughs> and, uh, and then you look at Aristotle, who has on this like velvet cloak, and he has on this big uh, golden chain. And he's touching the statue as if he wants to like, divine what's, what's, what is Homer thinking. But he has this completely blank expression on his face. And he clearly doesn't get it at all. So that the... <laughs> The figure of Aristotle actually looks more like a, like a statue than the sculpture of Homer, because he's lacking in that. And there you have, uh, and I think what's wonderful about that painting is you have the irony of the juxtaposition of the two, where you can see that Rembrandt knew what he was talking about. He knew that Aristotle was, yeah, was a faker, an oligarch. So go ahead and then. Yeah, I think that is, that's the question. That's great. And I think that you just demonstrate. He was asking the question. I'll, I'll recapitulate it, but please do, please everyone can speak up a lot. I know it's a lot harder to hear from back there. Anyway, uh, he was saying, well, LaRouche had referenced in a recent report that ever since the death of Brahms, you've had the degeneration of the United States and global culture because of the failure of classical music, which at that point forward, he refers to the idea that now you have popular noises, and that instead of music, right? <laughs> noises that people like to hear. And, uh, and the question that Omar posed is, how do you change things? How do you get people to think in a metaphorical way when they've been so degenerated for such a long time, and we have such a short amount of time to fix it? And uh, I mean, that's when I think what you make me think of when you say that is, um, is of the first stanza. Because what, what is provoked immediately are a rush of questions. Uh, who are these? What, what men and gods are these? What laden, maiden loth? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? And it's the fact that you, and he, he, he sets up these questions as the manifestation of the urn's ability to express the tale more sweetly than our rhyme. So what I mean by that is to say that the first, what comes first is wondering. The only way we're ever going to change things is first by asking the question that you asked. 
You see what I mean? So, so now that you've asked the question, now we, can, now we have a mission. And, if, and anyone who's asked that question of themselves has to take it on as a mission. You can't just sort of ask it and then say, well, that's it. We're probably, it's, real, it's really hard. Or you know what? I had a, I had a series of conversations with Marnie, with Marnie Black, who many people here know. And uh, she was talking to someone about, someone was saying, well, how are we possibly going to do anything? The, the, uh, the press loves Obama, this and that. It's going to be, the, you know, the, this, the, the people are stupid. How are we ever going to get this done? And she said, well, I'm telling you we're in a war, and you're saying they're shooting at us. <laughs> you're, like, as if you should be surprised that it's going to be hard, that it's going to be difficult, and that they're going to do everything they can to stop us. Right? So I think that what you're doing, what that question and that provocation is, that's the first step in victory. Is first we have to want victory. We have to try to figure it out. And my, the reason I'm giving the class is because one of the ways that we're going to do it is by studying Plato's dialogues. Because in Plato's dialogues, we see the first manifestation of metaphor. The first time that we have a, a method of metaphor presented for us that is the basis for Western civilization. And it's the very reason that we have 7 billion people on the planet today. And imagine, the last thing I'll say on this, is that the Pythagoreans, believe, they, they had already figured out, they had a theory of a heliocentric, um, a heliocentric solar system. They had already, the Pythagoreans who came before Plato and who we have almost zero fragments of, they had already figured out that, they, that we lived in a heliocentric uh, solar system. Uh, in other words, that they, sun at the center. <laughs> so the, uh, so Susan Kokinda, who I, I listened to some of the work that she's done on Plato, she says, imagine if that had not been lost. Imagine if the, if the, uh, if the library of Alexandria hadn't been run by an oligarchy. Imagine if they hadn't been burned down. Imagine if we had, you know, so there's just a, um, what I would reference just briefly is we need to keep in mind and the, an idea of terms of the method is the contrapuntal mode. That is to say, we have to continually present to ourselves and keep in our minds and keep in other people's minds a quality of the beautiful victory of the future of the beautiful, of this moment of, of political freedom, of the greatest art ever known to mankind. And that that exists. It does actually exist in the absolute maximum, as Kuza would say. It exists. We have to create it now. We have to draw ourselves towards that future, but it does exist. So when you ask the question, how are we going to do this, what the first thing, the first premise of that is that there is a way to do it. And that is something that you have to remember continuously. There is a way to win. We can win it. And then just to, you know, Plato, Plato, one man. Socrates, one man. You know, these were small groups of people who made the great contributions to our, our human race. So, and they were up against the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire, you know. They, and then, this was, this was when times were tough, right? So, so I would just, you know, that, that's how I would think of that. I'm sorry, Rick had something he wanted to add. I think we must. I think that's the only way. That's the only way we're going to achieve it. I think that's, that's it. That's, that's, what, that's what we're going to fight to do every day. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do here, I, I believe. Because he was saying, if, uh, can we use the principle of metaphor to get people to see that past the... But he said, you know, this, uh, it's not touching me. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, so therefore, how can I come to the conclusion yeah. that you're yeah. being threatened by annihilation? Yeah. Those, those people, they can't, uh, they, they, their methodology of thinking has been degraded, as Omar was talking about. They have been, they have lost their ability to think scientifically. They're not, th they don't, they don't have an understanding of the future as an actual existing uh, principle. Yeah. From what's, what's happening right now? Yeah. You, you, you get to a point where you can't but think that as things are developing, that it will not inevitably be to a Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're at that next season. Yeah. Where you, you, you simply, the, the Libyan thing has been such a fiasco. Mm -hmm. you know, Iraq was a fiasco, but it was okay. You have gas that, you know, whatever it is. But this thing, now it runs against other powers mm -hmm. are more minimal and can, you know, and, 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 the, and the forces put together are such an explosion, explosive mixture, you know, could actually, it, it's actually inevitably leading to it. This is, well, that's, that, that's a crucial question. And, uh, and I think that, that, I mean, I'm going to end this presentation by talking about um, the end of the oligarchical system, which was a paper that Lynn wrote September 7th in which he presents exactly the idea that you just put forth there as part of an aspect of what he's talking about, is that there is, this is going to break. Thermonuclear war is going to break it. You know, the, the potential for thermonuclear war is such an earth-shattering, um, of such grave, <laughs> incredible existential danger for the human race that you could actually break out of this party system that it's because of this crisis that we could, this is one of the ways that we can move beyond. Yeah, but people do not accept that. That's, that's why, we, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. So let me, uh, let me take the next 20 minutes and we'll go through Theotetus. We'll go through a short section of that. And then we'll refer to Lynn's paper. And, and then what we're, I think the mission, as Omar set it forth, and as you're setting it forth right now, Evelyn, is how do we do this? That, in other words, we're going to have to figure out how to do this, right? And, uh, and that, when, you, when you phrase it like that, as this positive mission, well, we're just going to have to do it, then it becomes a lot more joyful. And you, and you don't allow yourself to be frustrated. Yeah. OK, so let's see. So in the Theotetus, what's taking up, shoot, okay. Oh, okay, I've got, so I've got about 40 minutes. All right, not even, 30 minutes, that's okay. So I'm gonna refer to a shorter section of the Theotetus where we get into an idea of the, uh, of metaphor in these terms, okay? Metaphor being an understanding of the principle that the quality that is the defining quality of the human race, all right, which is creativity, is the subsuming principle of the universe, which is to say the universe continually develops just as humankind does. And that's the principle of, me principle of metaphor, and that's what we have to communicate to people, and that's an idea of the future. And if they don't get that, if the leading figures of the world do not have a glimpse and a glimmer of that, then we will not survive. That's, that's the postulate, just as Athens did not survive. OK? Yes. So. So what we're going to be looking at is the idea that the, the principle of human creativity, which is the quality that sets humanity apart, right? the ability of mankind to discover the principles of the universe, mirrors the creativity of the universe itself. Okay, so 
You want to be Theotetus? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna. I'm. I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask for your um, focus for the next. Okay. I'm gonna ask for focus on the next about five minutes. It's. It's. Uh, we're in the middle of the dialogue, so it's a little bit difficult, but just stick with it, and I'm sure. And I think that the key idea will come through. Because this, uh, what we first have to identify is, as I presented at the beginning, what is knowledge? Knowledge is not sense perception per se. So we're about to defeat that. Socrates says, consider then, Theotetus, this further point about what has been said. Now you answered that perception is knowledge. Did you not? So right now, yes, I'm sorry. So they're, they're, t <laughs> they're testing the hypothesis, okay, which we know to be false. So just so everyone's on the same page. Testing the hypothesis that perception is knowledge. Uh, yes. <laughs> if then anyone should ask you, by what does a man see white and black colors and by what does he hear high and low tones, you would, I fancy, say, by his eyes and ears. Yes, I should. The easy use of words and phrases and the avoidance of strict precision is in general a sign of good breeding. Indeed, the opposite is hardly worthy of a gentleman. But sometimes it is necessary as now it is necessary to object to your answer, insofar as it is incorrect. Just consider, which answer is more correct, that our eyes are that by which we see, or that through which we see, and our ears are that by which we see, uh, excuse me, by which we hear, or that through which we hear? So the question is by rather through. So let's 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 like take it through and see. I think Socrates should perceive through rather than by in each case. Yes, for it would be strange indeed, my boy, if there are many senses ensconced within us, as if we were so many wooden horses of Troy, and they do not all unite in one power whether we should call it soul or something else, by which we perceive through these as instruments the objects of perception. So the preposition through is supposed to imply that our sense, sense organs are instruments, that they are not uh, uh, islands unto themselves, but they're instruments that we're using. So the question is, what is using the instruments? It, okay. I think what you suggest. Yeah, I think, well, in science, they say that the eyes or the ears of the gentle organ is being used is what it's picking up mm -hmm. on the perception. Mm -hmm. But it's interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly the point we're getting to here. Go ahead. I think what you suggest is more likely in any other way. Now the reason why I am so precise about the matter is this. I want to know whether there is some one and the same power within ourselves by which we perceive black and white through the eyes and again other qualities through the other organs and whether you will be able, if asked, to refer to all such activities to the body. But perhaps it is better that you make the statement in answer to a question that I should take all the trouble for you. So tell me, do you not think that all the organs which you perceive, through which you perceive hot and hard and light and sweet are parts of the body? Or are they parts of something else? Of nothing else. 
And will you also be ready to agree that it is impossible to perceive through one sense what you perceive through another? For instance, to perceive through sight what you perceive through hearing, or through hearing what you perceive through sight? Of course I shall. Then if you have any thought about both of these together, you would not have perception about both together, either through one organ or through the other. No. Now in regard to sound and color, you have in the first place this thought, in the first place this thought about both of them, that they both exist. Certainly. The thought comes first. And that each is different from the other and the same as itself. And that both together are two, and each separately is one. Yes, that also. And are you able also to observe whether they are like or unlike each other? Maybe. <laughs> now, through what organ do you think all this about them? For it is impossible to grasp that which is common to them, both either through hearing or through sight. Here is further evidence to the point I am trying to make. If it were possible to investigate the question whether the two, sound and color, are bitter or not, you know that you will be able to tell by what faculty you will investigate it, and that it is clearly neither hearing nor sight, but something else. So to address it, we have these comparisons. He's comparing like and unlike. Uh, if something is, uh, and what is making the comparisons? Because your, he your ear is not making the comparison, and your tongue is not making the comparison. So what is making the comparison between the two? Oh, no, I'm sorry. He, so he asked about whether something is bitter. Can you see if something is bitter? Can you hear if something is bitter? No. Of course it is. The fact is exerted. So you'd have to use your tongue. Very good. But through what organ is the faculty exerted, which makes known to you that which is common to all things? as well as to these of which we are speaking, that which you call being and not being, and the other attributes of things, about which we were asking just now. What organs will you assign for all these, through which that part of us which perceives gains perception of each and all of them? Bravo, Theotetus, you follow me exactly. That is just what I mean by my question. By Zeus, Socrates, I cannot answer except that I think there is no special organ at all for these notions, as there are for those others. But it appears to me that the soul views by itself directly, that all things have to come. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. But the idea, um, pardon me. <laughs> so, um, well, I don't want to take up too much more time reading from that, but um, the idea is there is something that is between the gaps of sense perception, as LaRouche put it, that faculty of humanity which can compare the anomalies between two sense senses and determine what's like something else and what's unlike something else. And everyone here can understand readily that that is the mind. And the point is that this is not, um, this is not some mechanistic uh, quality of a brain. This is not just a bunch of neurons firing, but that there is something that is uh, of a higher quality, uh, referred to, he says, a soul or whatever you would name it. The question is what you mean by experience, you know, because I think what, what he's referencing in particular is an idea of a higher existence of man. So that you heard, for example, you're not your flesh and blood. So what are you? 
does your, or as Lynn pr- repeatedly refers to it, does your, is your life begin with your birth and end with your death? Is that a human life? It is. Because what is it about you that exists even when your body's not around? Uh-huh. Is there anything that exists yes. about me? Yes. My body is <laughs> Yes. Other than the ashes. Well, shall we open that up? Do people have ideas on this? Well, I mean, it uh, has a lot to do with your religious beliefs. I, mm-hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. I don't care to say, but I Sure, sure. You say, uh, I guess I use my heart instead of using my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think that makes sense. When you're making a moral decision, it's... Uh, it's something that doesn't have anything to do necessarily with, um, like whether it's good for your for your flesh and bl- blood identity or not, right? Because humanity has the ability to make a decision for a higher purpose than because it benefits me in this life, like Joan of Arc, right? Who knows that she's going to die? She knows that what she's doing in in fighting for the state of, for the nation state, first nation state of France is gonna get her killed. She does it anyway. Now, if she... I just have to speak. Mm -hmm. I'm a retired teacher. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm gonna live on in my student's brain even after I'm gone. And I will influence, I have influenced them forever. Mm -hmm. But, but wait a second, if the mind is, is fully biological, then how could what Goethe just said be true? How could it be? Because it's not like she's like picking up bits of her brain and putting it and open up their mind and putting the brain in. So there's no biological. Well, do you, ha- do you have to believe in it for it to be true? That's what the sophist would say, is that if you don't believe in it, it's not true. I just know that the mind is a portion of the brain that can interpret those things. Yeah. The human being biologically is still a part of the animal kingdom. Biologically, he is an animal like the lower animals, but the lower animals just operate by the brain. They don't have a mind. But the human being is the highest form of biological. Okay, now I hear what you're saying, but hold on, let's slow down for a moment. Shannon had something to say, Wes had something to say, I think Rick, Rick wanted to say something, Evelyn, if you'd like to, please do, but just to set the stage, okay? I am here, in part, to bust your axiom, to, to get you to see that, that you, that if you're thinking about this question of evolution of the, the mind, in terms of something that's going to happen sequentially, Added, additively, step by step, you're getting more and more and more of a mind? I would say no. No, the mind is primary. 
because the mind actually is something that is that organizes the whole. So I'm just going to say that, and I'm trying to try not to go too much into it. So, so we are at attacking that particular idea overall through this movement. Okay. The question is, what are the implications, and so on and so forth. But let me see if I can get a few people, and then we'll come to you, Rod. Okay. Please go ahead. That's a really good. Now we're get now we're getting cooking. That's a really good question. Yeah, why? What, what 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 what's the purpose? Because that gets to an idea if there's a why, if you're asking the question of why, then through Plato's through the Socratic dialogue, through the method that is contained within the Platonic dialogues, you can investigate it. When you have that why, then it presumes, as I was saying with Omar, it presumes that we live in a reasonable universe, that there is a sufficient, Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason, there is a reason that things are as they are and not otherwise. So, so why? Why is it that, is it important? What, what is, and that, that, those are the questions that Plato takes up. And my, my point is partly that the corruption of the society can be seen in the sense that your question right there is completely taboo today. Is that, or, or, and, and, and really rigorously following through on that question is not accepted in the culture because it's immediately assumed before the fact that there is no reason. That for example, if you go to, if you go for um, Obama, I was reading through some of his uh, biography and he was a student of postmodern literature, which I was too. Um, and uh, postmodern literature I, starts with the assumption that there is no such thing as teleological meaning. There's no such thing as a purpose for a purpose as you're, as you're asking. It assumes before you ever ask the question that there's no such thing. It assumes that, as they say, reality is flat. And, uh, and Obama thinks this way. He's someone who thinks from the standpoint of the idea that there is no purpose to humankind. There is no higher reality. There's no reason why it's important to think about the question of immortality. So that's what I would present. I was just thinking about what I was talking about, sort of the biological aspects of people. I mean, you think about sort of our biology is sort of determined by time and born grow up, you die, it's sort of controlled by what you time, by time. Uh, then we have Plato who lived 2,500 years ago, who we're reading his dialogues, he's still alive within us. And you would say, well, his mind is not like 2,500 years ago, it's, it's still the same mind we have now, and it's not uh, affected by time, it's same way that you would say like our body or not something above time. As we were talking about with the Ode to the Grecian Urn, Ode on a Grecian Urn, is that there's something, there's a quality of metaphor that is above, that is, is somehow ordered before time. Not in the sense of like a timeline, but is ordered above, before, somehow outside of our normal sense of time, of space, time, and such. Oh, throw it in, throw it on. But keep it short. The difference, the significant difference that separates the human mind uh -huh. and regardless of the physiological factors of the mind is this. Uh, you have a belief structure in a creator, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if you put that aside completely mm -hmm. and you 
you said creator doesn't exist, so you want to be an atheist or whatever. Okay. The human mind has a capability of conceiving that which you cannot see and cannot prove and working it out. The excellent element of this is chaos theory. Uh, I reserve you the right. You cannot see, one second. You I cannot reserve the right to interrupt. One second, let me finish. Okay. This. You cannot see the particles involved, but you can work them out mathematically. And they can be proved out mathematically. Okay, I want to take. You can't see them. You can't yeah. see them. Rod, I want to take something from what you're saying here. But I want to take chaos theory and I want to put it on the side. We're going to put it to the side. We can, we can take that up another day. Yeah, put it on the shelf. All right. So, what I want to, we have about a half hour left and I want to finish, I want to finish in like 20 minutes or less. So, I'm going to, let me just present a little bit of an idea of how we're going to wrap this up. And I'm going to read a couple of quotes from Lynn and then we can discuss those. Um, and, uh, Yeah. Okay. Because I think the real key, we're talking about metaphor. We're talking about the idea of the silent, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. We're talking about the idea of, of an infinitude, of, of something that is not commensurable, with, that is not measurable by the, the ordinary means. Okay, so we're talking about the fact that you can talk to Plato today, or to Socrates today. He lives today. That, that, that you live in the people that you affect. In terms of, and here's the, here's the key, here's my answer, here's LaRouche's answer to Shannon's question, which is, the reason to concern yourself with immortality is that you may do good for those who come after. Okay? That's that you may make life better for the generations that follow. Now this is something that everyone somehow knows without having to learn it, in a sense. I'm sure you can remember when you were six years old and you knew this, right? Or when you were younger and you had this sense of it. Because it's, a, it's an idea of an identity with those who come after and an identity with those who came before. Which is, an, which is the idea of the immortal soul. Which is the idea that we have something in common that has nothing to do with our physical body at all. That, that I have a shared experience with you, and not even experience, but I have a shared quality that is higher in terms of its ordering than our existence here today. And, uh, and I mean, people, I mean, if you're really, if you're thoughtful about this and you're introspective, it's clear. Um, I was speaking to a friend who recently lost his grandparents and it was a very challenging situation where he wasn't able to see them before they passed. He was fighting to get down to see them at the hospital but because of certain other factors he wasn't able to be there so he missed it. And there had been some family strife and he was quite, uh, he was quite, we, the question came up like, I didn't get to say goodbye. I didn't, get to, I didn't get to tell them what I'm doing. I didn't get to really prove to them that I'm a good person, or, and so on and so forth. And with an understanding that we have of man's creativity, with this sort of rigorous scientific question of the soul, there is peace that is available. Because there's a way of identifying that what makes those people truly human is right the divine spark is the creative spark within each human being and that that is the shared quality and that's why we identify with those who come later and that's why we identify with the two billion people across the world who do not have, do not have electricity that's why we identify with the 47 million people in the country who do not have, who are living on food stamps, and so on and so forth. That's why we identify with the 300,000 people who have been murdered by the United States government over the past 10 years. And that's why it matters, is because we're humans. Um, so, so let me let me just take up a couple of things here, and I want to reorient us. Yeah. Are you 
Or uh -huh. are you saying it's something we learn? Now that's, ooh, that's a good question. I, I, I was presenting it from the standpoint of the idea that a feeling that I have that people do have, that, that everyone in this room has that and that they have had that and that you probably don't recall how you developed it. I don't recall like learning it. I disagree. Ah. I think there are little children who all they think about is themselves. Ah. So the question is why? Why is it that they do not know? Because I think that, I mean, that's a good, I'm glad that you brought that up. They learn it as they go through, you know, they go to school. Uh -huh. But is it something that you learn by, by rote? Is it something, by rote? Is it something that I can just tell you? Learn it through your feelings for others. Through your feelings for others, through your emotions? Because here's, here's why I'd say we return to metaphor. You learn it through metaphor. You learn it through an understanding of the gaps in sense perception where, and this is the crucial gap, is that I am you, in a sense. I don't mean to be like uh, touchy-feely or hokey about this, but, but in the sense of a grandfather to a grandson. They have an identity. They look at each other and they say, you, you and I are the same. Even though we're different, we're the same. And we're united. There's a union between the two of us which is our, uh, our connection. So, so I think that's a good, th thank you for bringing that up, because that is the challenge, is I think that that's what's Omar, what Omar is presenting, is that we have a huge crowd of people who don't feel the way that the people in this room do. They don't think the way that we do. They actually think from the standpoint of an idea that human beings are simply beasts that know pleasure and pain and nothing else, and that I'm gonna get mine, right? I'm going to get mine. And people who are school teachers in this room, or have been, know that what you're saying is very true, that, and Lynn has referenced this too, that even we're looking at five and six-year-olds now who are gone, who are already corrupted. That is to say, who already have embedded within themselves this mindset. And that is tragic. It is completely, it is, it is a great, great tragedy. Because there's no reason it should be that way. So thank you for catching me there. That's, um, okay, but so, so why Plato? Why should you read Plato? Let's think about it from that perspective. Because everyone knows the, um, everyone knows the, uh, everyone knows the basic, most, most famous allegory of Plato, right? Which is the allegory of the cave. The allegory of the cave, which says that there's an idea of reality where imagine that you are chained in a cave and you're looking at a wall and there's people passing behind you. There's a fire and they're passing in front of the fire, but they're behind you and they have different like vases and objects and, and so forth that they're passing by and you're looking you're chained and looking at the wall. You cannot move. And you see these shadows playing across the wall. And you think, that's reality. It's the shadows. The shadows are real. And then one day, you get to go to the surface. And you get to see the sun. And the sun is what's true. And that changes you forever. And you go back down into the cave and you try to tell people, there's a sun up there. And they say, what are you talking about? The shadows are right here. <laughs> they say, you're crazy. That's insane. This is reality. It's what you've seen before. It's the shadows. And Lynn indicates that this is, this concept, the entirety of the corpus of Plato's Socratic dialogues is premised on a concept which he popularized as the allegory of Plato's cave. What our senses show us is not the reality which impacts our senses, but rather the shadows which that impact casts on the mind, as if shadows cast on the irregular wall surface of a firelit cave. So the principle of metaphor would be analogous to an idea of you looking at the shadows and you're noticing um, and you're noticing anomalies. And you're able to figure out, 
from the shadows what the object really is. And the best example, I wish I had, I'm not prepared for it, um, but the best example I can think of is the one that Jason Ross gave in his videos on metaphor and Kepler, which is if you look at, if, you were to, if I were to have a screen here, right, if we use the screen, and through the screen you can see a shadow, and the shadow is a circle. And then I show you another shadow, and the shadow is a square. And then I tell you, these are the same object. What object is it? First you see cylinder. Yeah, it's a cylinder. Because from one angle, you're just going to see the, uh, the circle on the front. And then if I flip it, and it's a perfectly, you know, it's, it's the, the, the height and the length are the same, it'll look like a square. And so that is the principle of metaphor, is that you look at the irregularities, the anomalies, the gaps in sense perception, and you imagine at a higher idea what the reality really is. The reality is neither of the shadows. The shadows aren't the reality. The reality is something that is unseen. So let me read through a couple more quotes. And um, what I didn't get to, which is crucial in Theotetus, um, and I'm just going to reference it, um, is an idea of power. I'll just take about five minutes. And uh, I, I could do a whole other class on this, or a series of classes. I really, that would really be the way to do it. Um, but I'm just going to give you a glimpse of it, a glimmer of it, and, and, uh, and try to reference it, try to refer to it to the, uh, the ode as a way of thinking about it. So over the course of the dialogue, Theotetus, um, Socrates asks Theotetus if he's, he's asked him about how do you, uh, uh, let me think, what is it that he's asking exactly? He's asking him about the idea of a class of objects that are somehow of a different quality um, from a lower class of objects. Could you have different classes of objects that somehow are incommensurable? That is to say, they could not be measured one against the other. And Theotetus says, well, yeah, I, I've been thinking about this in regards to roots and surds. OK? Maybe Gerda could get up and teach us this part. Um, she was a math teacher. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to be able to go into this with the depth that it deserves. So what I can do most of all is recommend to you to really study the Theotetus because it has opened up for me a lot of, uh, a lot of my thinking on, um, on what quality of thinking Lynn is, is telling us we need to have now in order to defeat the oligarchy, in order to win this battle. Um, but the idea is, if you're looking for the, the square root, the length of the square, the length of the hypotenuse, for example, here, of here's a square of one by one, right? What is the root? The root is the square root of two, we would say, right? What is the, that is to say, what is, what is the length of the hypotenuse? Can you have a, a rational, a, a perfect ratio between the square root of 2 and 1? Does this go a certain number of times in, does 1 go a certain number of times in the square root of 2? It's impossible. You cannot. You can't, there's not any perfect ratio. It's not like 4 to 5 or 4.89 to 5 or anything like that. It's, there's a, uh, this is incommensurable. You cannot compare one to the other. And then you cannot measure one by means of the other. 
you couldn't break this down into sections of one. And as you continue to go around uh, to square root of three, square root of four, square root of five, and so forth, you continue to ha have the same relationship where only in certain cases, right, like 16, is the, is the root going to be something that is commensurable? 4 to 16 is commensurable. But square root of 15 is rather more difficult. So if I could do this class over again, I would probably put aside about a half hour to go through this idea. But the, uh, the intention is um, to get across an idea of power, of power. And the power, hmm, how can I present this best? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through a comment that Lynn made. And I'm just going to leave this for now. And in the future, I would like to do a class on, on this particular topic. And I could take a full hour and a half to go through it. Um, but you can see the spiral um, action of this method. Hmm. Okay, well let me just read this. We make too much of sense perception as such. Put it properly into the class of until we have access to something better, rely on what you have actually gained. Find some way of making the best of what is possible with such crutches as the mind of the mind as that until we gain a better means. So let me just make sure that I'm, I'm not crossing wires here. I'm going to leave aside the question of powers, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to some things, basic things that Lynn has had to say about Plato. Because the best thing you can do in order to get a concept of that idea I just gave a glimmer of, and not a very good one, is to read it yourself. So now I'm going to talk. I'm going to, going to sort of start the closing by talking about how Lynn addresses Plato. We make too much of sense perception as such. This is LaRouche. Put it properly, put sense perception that is properly into the class of until we have access to something better, rely on that which you have actually gained. Find some way of making the best of what is possible with such crutches of the mind as that until we gain a better means. Sense perception is not your proper god, although many poor fools worship it as a virtual religion. And then he says something that's just completely provocative. For example, we have discovered a much better one, the speed of light. So let me read it again. Sense perception is not your proper god, although many poor fools worship it as a virtual religion. For example, we have discovered a much better one, the speed of light. Okay. We must seek of things which coincide with the notion of the speed of light, and thus converge attentions on a single principle which tends to consume all known varieties of the human's power to comprehend the human power of, con of conception. To accomplish that mission, we must proceed from the standpoint of exploring the experience of the universe as a sense of mission orientation. Step by step and piece by piece, we must avoid the deception which mere sense perception as such represents. So that, that very idea, the deception of mere sense perception as such, that's what Lin has identified as what's crucial about the Platonic dialogues is the allegory of the cave. So when he's talking about this, he's also he's referencing the allegory of the cave, in a sense. He's referencing this whole question that we've been going through. So we have to avoid the deception which mere sense perception as such represents. The process of discovery of truth proceeds from its birth in the guise of metaphor. He continues in this paper to take on to take on the mindset of Obama. And as he said recently, about a week ago, that it's 
Obama's mind, this, the, and anyone who supports Obama or thinks like Obama, that are going to kill the human race. Okay? And what, how does Obama think? Well, he thinks that sense perception is reality. He doesn't, he doesn't think like a human being. He doesn't think according to the principle of metaphor. So, Lynn, once again, in this, this polemic against sense perception, mankind has simply no direct access to the knowledge of the universe, as if by a mechanical notion of an additive approach to the rendering of the facts of actual or fabricated notions of sense perception. It is through the uncovering of the proof of the deceits, deceit by deceit, of blind faith in sense perception as such, that a quality attributable to truth becomes accessible, which, by destroying naive faith in mere sense perception, eliminates customary delusions of the ignorant, all done as if in tracking down lies to the lairs where they have lurked. Mankind's original quality of dependency on sense perception, sense certainty, as distinct from sense impression, is thus the true author of all lies. It is by the recognition of those lies as being deceptions, by consuming them as if they were cooked meat, that we conquer and consume the sources of ignorance, sources of ignorance which exist chiefly as forms of the ignorance encountered as popular beliefs. The greatest, the most pro-satanic of all beliefs is popular ignorance. That is the essential root of evil. So the reason, that is the, that's the essential root of evil, popular ignorance. The reason I want to close on this conception is to reference Omar's question, Evelyn's question, Rick's question. How are we going to defeat these bastards? How are we going to stop the people who want to reduce the population of the globe to one and a half to two billion people? This seems like an incredibly difficult battle. How are we going to get people who do not uh, think that the, with the crisis, the various explosions in the Middle East will affect them to recognize that it will? Well, it's precisely by attacking the deceits, the lies of sense perception as such. It's by attacking not the, not, and, and to be clear, not the lies themselves. You're not going to get someone and like, remember what I was saying about myself here in January? And I was trying to figure out, well, what, what particular myths am I going to have to puncture? How am I going to build up to telling people about World War III? That's not how it's going to work. It's not by like, gradually convincing people. It's by attacking the system by which they think, the methodology of their thinking, which is this sat pro-satanic belief, sophist belief in popular opinion in sense perception as such. So people uh, who are allowed to believe that because something is a popular opinion, it is true, those people are going to destroy your society. So we have to attack that system of, of belief. And we're going to bring it down deceit by deceit, lie by lie by lie. And we're going to bring it down with the method of metaphor. So the way that I would directly reference this is Lynn made some comments last Thursday, this past Thursday, on what is the approach to bringing down Obama right now. And he said, he said it this way. He said, you're going to go fact, 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 fact. He's got to go. All right? Which is kind of a funny thing to say, because uh, <laughs> why, why is <laughs> Why is it like that today? Why, why are we talking about facts? I thought we were talking about metaphor. But what he's saying is there are these, there's this stack of deceits that Obama's presidency represents. There's this stack after stack, this one cover-up after another, crime after crime after crime after crime. And this is going to blow. And we have to, anyway, so that, we, we, we just rapid fire aggressively 
attack on this, on this notion, on all of, these, all of these deceits, one after another. And in doing so, at the same time, we're presenting to people a, the future as it could be and as it should be. And it's the anomaly between the two which will allow access of the person you're talking to to the principle of metaphor. That's my hypothesis. So just to, just to recap that, that you're going to have to relate to them the utter extreme danger of what's taking place right now, the otherworldly, just completely unimaginable danger we're in at the same time that you're presenting to them another picture of what the world should be and could be. Attack really heavy on Obama and then the anomaly of the beautiful future versus the current danger creates a, a, an anomaly whereby the person can access an idea of their own humanity. And what, I'm, what am I going to have to do? One is, what is between the notes? Well, what's between the notes is me. It's my humanity. And you're going to get, and we are securing our humanity by fighting. So there, there's, that, that's, my, that's my idea on how, on how we use metaphor today. So, uh, today I want to pick up from the class that I did on Philo of Alexandria, which I think probably maybe half the people here were there. The, uh, the idea then was very much this question of who, what is the enemy? Who is the enemy? What is the enemy? What are we fighting? You know, why... Why are, we, uh, why are we a political movement that's, that, that's talking about Plato? Why are we a political movement that's talking about Philo of Alexandria? You know, what, why is this so important? And the polemic that we began to develop there, that is certainly something, you know, this is what Lynn is pressing on us, LaRouche is pressing on us to continue to develop in this time of incredible danger, is against the belief in sense perception as such, sense certainty otherwise known as, right? The idea which I'll develop across the course of this, that um, the idea that reality is perception. It's what you can see before you, right? This is what we are opposed to. This is the empire as it exists in the mind, because the battlefield is in the mind, right? And that's the, uh, what I intend to demonstrate over the course of the class is that you have, um, we're going to go through the case of Plato, in particular the, uh, the, the Theotetus uh, dialogue, uh, which I've been studying over the past about month and a half or two months. We've been doing weekly readings um, with some of the people out in Detroit. And it's been just tremendous to begin to get a fuller sense of 3,000 years of history and to, give your, to get into your own mind and, th and sort of place yourself within those 3,000 years and then on into infinity, uh, which of course, you know, this is, this, is the, uh, this is the way that LaRouche thinks. This is the way that Martin Luther King thought. This is the way that Joan of Arc was thinking in terms of a, a true uh, sense of, of what is the battle? What, why are we fighting? And why is it that we continue to fight? So um, the question is, what is the, uh, what's the weapon? How do we bring down the, the empire of empiricism, reductionism, whatever you want to call it, These, this, this belief in sense, sense certainty? And the answer has been emphatically metaphor. Through an investigation and the use and the demonstration of the principle of metaphor, we will be victorious. And there's no other way to do it. 
It's not, there's not some sort of like cheat, corn, you know, cut the corner and get there some other way. The only way that we're going to accomplish this transformation is through the use of metaphors. So the question is, who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of its folk this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. So it's such a rich poem that there's, um, there's these beautiful ironies in practically every line. Uh, but I wanted to reference a couple. I mean, uh, first of all, there's the overarching irony of the fact that he is immortalizing the urn in verse. So what we are presented with is the living ghost of the Grecian urn, which it exists now in a higher form even than its actual physical reality. And he has truly made it immortal through this poem. So that's, that's something that's, that, that encircles the whole. And then throughout you have these, uh, you have these, uh, these ironies. For example, the very, the very beginning he says, Sylvan historian, who canst thou thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? And then there's the colon. So here's, here's thus you express it. And what he goes into is a series of questions. Uh, so there is, clearly there's something behind the notes, behind the scenes, so to speak. There's something between the notes of, he's saying that this, the urn is expressing something. What it provokes is question after question after question after question, this wondering, this, this, this quality of, um, of continual uh, desire to know, to know more, to know what, what, is, what is the quality of this. Um, rather than what you might expect, which would be an ekphrasis, a, uh, a detailed explanation, right, where he would say, oh, well, well, first there's, what does that mean? What is metaphor? What, what is Lynn talking about when every paper he writes, he seems to be talking about metaphor over the past six months, over the past year? And that's, so that's the idea today, is to get into that through a lens of Plato in particular and the Theotetus dialogue. Uh, so I want to just, before we get really started, the way that I think about this practically is I can remember sitting back where Eli's sitting uh, on, a, on a day about a week and a half, two weeks before I, uh, I joined full time. And that was back in February. So the meeting must have been mid-January. And Jason Ross of the basement, Leona of the basement, they were um, giving a class. And the class was on, uh, it was on the galactic cycles and various other things. It was quite remarkable to me. But at the end of the class, I stood up and I was trying to figure out, maybe Diane remembers, I was trying to figure out how do you organize someone about the impending threat of thermonuclear annihilation? How on earth am I supposed to talk to anyone about this? 
you know, because I was trying to, trying to figure it out. Sure, okay, so I'm, there's some kind of pathway. There's some way, I, if I just get a couple of stepping stones, then I'll be able to leap to the, to the threat of war, of, of the annihilation of the human race, right? <laughs> so I stood up and I asked this rambling question where I didn't really know where I was going, I didn't know really, really know what I was saying, but I, I put forth all these predicates. I said, well, considering X and considering Y and considering Z, and then finally I just said, how do you tell people that we're facing thermonuclear war. And Jason Ross was very direct about it. He said, well, you should just tell them. <laughs> you know, you should, just, you should just assert it. But you have to use metaphor. You cannot, uh, you have to demonstrate to someone that there is a reality that is located in the future that is outside of time as we know it. That is to say, clock time. That is outside of the sort of normal understanding that this dark age society operates under. So you have to, you have to puncture some, someone's axioms and lift them up. But he was clear on this that the only way, you, the first thing you got to do is you got to just tell it to them straight. You got to assert it, and you have to do that with leadership. Um, so that's what it means practically to me about the question of metaphor and what is and how can this develop our minds is getting ourselves, everyone in this room and everyone that we talk to, to be capable of addressing the fact that the enemy is reductionism, the enemy are these fallacies, we, we are going to attack those with metaphor, that's how we're going to achieve the mission of the, of the continual development and progress of mankind. Excuse me. So I wanted to begin with just a um, with a classic and very pure example of metaphor in Ode on a Grecian Urn. So I gave everyone should have a copy, but if you don't, then Denise has some in the back. And please just say so. So Eli needs a set. Does anyone else need a set? Diane? Because this poem is very frequently referenced by Lynn. And uh, it's, of course, extremely famous. So we're just going to go through it. And I'm going to try to point out a couple of the ironies that are set before us and give us a framework for thinking about what is metaphor. And then we're going to actually refer to something that, that Lynn has written on this. And then we are going to go into Plato. So I'll wait until everyone's sitting down, and then I'll, and I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a go. Of course, this is a poem that he is writing to a Grecian urn, to an ancient urn that has embossed on it a, a, a pastoral scene. Um, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals? or of both, in Tempe, or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loth? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, Play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. 
yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss, for ever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy bows, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm, and still to be enjoyed, forever panting, and forever young. All breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. This, there's, it's this God and it's this maiden and it's this story and there's four of them and they're at this river and so on and so forth. Instead, that's not it at all. It has nothing to do with the details. It has everything to do with this higher existence of the, uh, of the artwork, of the beauty itself. So then a couple other things I wanted to bring out in it. You have, uh, you have this, this quality that I'll reference, we, we'll get a reference to it later in, some, in what Lynn wrote that I gave to you, of, um, of this moment in time that is suspended and somehow plucked entirely from time and, and, and above time now because it's been elevated through beauty above the question of clock time into a sort of a spiritual time, when, which is eternal, which would be, that is to say, uh, a time without, uh, yeah, without before and after, or whatever you want to say. Um, so that, for example, the bold lover never can, never, 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 never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. He's never, ever going to kiss her, but he's always winning towards the goal. He's always almost about to, which is, of course, uh, an anomaly. That's an irony, because how could he possibly be almost about to kiss her if he's never, ever, ever going to kiss her? And yet, it exists in this form. Um, And there's, of course, there's much more that we could go into, but I, I went down to the, to the second to last stanza. Um, and this, this, this once more, this type of irony where he's appealing to, he's wondering about this, not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. No one can ever come out of the village and walk up and say, hey, well, this is, you know, the, the village is empty because uh, because uh, th this will never take place. Um, and yet he mourns for it, in a sense. He grieves for this fact, despite the fact that it, it's entirely in the mind. That this, is a, this has nothing, it, it is not sensual, in a sense. So the last stanza is, of course, the richest, or at least the most famous, and it has this. What, what I want to select in particular from it and we will return to beauty is truth, truth, beauty. But is this line, this, uh, in the middle, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. And in terms of the uh, structure of the, uh, of the, of this stanza, it's quite, this enjambment, where you have the, the line is broken up into two parts, right there. Because no, normally, if you look into the the, uh, the structure of the poem, he has uh, basically more or less uh, like four lines that are a single idea, and then four lines, and then two lines, and those comprise a a, a, a stanza. 